Okay, colleagues, greetings and welcome back. So today, a very special topic. Every topic is a special topic in its own right. Today, we are going to talk about Thucydides. Uh, one of the alleged uh, uh, or uh, renowned founders of the uh, international political theory. Mm, also, at the same time, one of the founders of uh, theoretical historiography. One of the first mm, social scientists, you could say, um, in the Western tradition, but also in the world intellectual tradition. So, um, formally, um, this is a... Um, lecture within, the inter, uh, uh, within my Introduction to International Political Theory course. However, Thucydides is of uh, greater general philosophical significance, and I'll try to bring that out as well. So, um, so since this is officially the lecture, uh, uh, <laughs> which I'm streaming through YouTube, after the lecture, we're going to have a question and answer session uh, in Teams, um, in case you want to ask anything, and maybe we'll talk about housekeeping a little bit after that. Um, but let me let me let me proceed with the with a general plan. Well, with the general plan of, of our lecture. So, um, first of all, po quite possibly, in order to understand Thucydides, in order to understand and appreciate his philosophy fully, uh, it would be nice um, to have like a general introduction to ancient Greek history, ancient Greek culture, civilization, uh, and ancient Greek philosophy. Mm. That might take a long time, and um, I don't think that we formally have the space for all of this. However, like in terms of, not in terms of an essential requirement, but in terms of further reading, uh, there's actually a whole list of uh, um, videos available. Uh, uh, so, so I, first of all, I have my videos, both on YouTube and on Coursera. I actually have a whole playlist about the ancient Greeks. Right, which hopefully will introduce you to the basic um, insights of the ancient Greek philosophy in case you want to learn about them. But this is, this is all, I, I imagine, this is all further uh, uh, material. So let me, let me signal this is further material. Um, and also there's a whole bunch of courses and videos I could recommend. There's a wonderful course by Donald Kagan from the uh, uh, um, um, open, open Yale courses. So this is from Yale. There's also a wonderful um, course by Elizabeth Vandiver, uh, available from the Great Courses TTC, which now I think is called Wondrium. Um, these are at least a couple I can, I can uh, uh, mention from the top of my head. Uh, and this is all, of course, strictly, strictly supplementary in case you want to dig deeper into the context. Um, so without further ado, let me, let me start talking about Thucydides. Well, actually, before I talk about Thucydides proper, let me situate um, I, our discussion of Thucydides in the general intellectual context. So, as you know, the two main disciplines... I, te I teach many courses, but the two main courses I teach uh, these days um, is a philosophy of science and political philosophy. Um, and actually, I mean, actually, in, in, to, um, to be precise, there are several courses in philosophy of science which I teach. Philosophy of the natural science, also philosophy of the social science. And when I talk about political philosophy, this you know, introduction to social philosophy, uh, political philosophy, history of Western philosophy, but um, also you know, history of ethics, more history of Western moral, moral philosophy, a little bit, of, a little bit about um, philosophy outside the West as well. And so, but you know, to, to oversimplify, to oversimplify, I would say that my main research interest uh, uh, is on the interface between philosophy of science and philosophy of politics. And within this interface, I feel um, that actually the notion of the scientific revolution is a very um, important, very relevant one. So I have this phrase on the slide, the long scientific revolution, basically from, from Copernicus to uh, Foucault. In fact, you know, if you want to be, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 ambitious about this, you could say long scientific revolution from Thales to Foucault. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Thales is supposed to be the founder, right, of ancient Greek philosophy, but also of the <laughs> Western style uh, rationalist empiricist uh, science, right? Um, and I would say that kind of the main idea behind this long scientific revolution, um, it's a, you know, what, what I'm saying right now is one way to look at history of science and one way to look 
at the history of human intellectual evolution. But I do think it's a, I do think it's a very robust way. Not everybody shares this view, obviously. Let me signal this from, from the very beginning. Um, and um, uh, uh, but you, you see, this is this is the issue with studying philosophy. In philosophy, everything is contentious. So I am skeptic first. You know, skeptic skeptic first, and everything everybody every, everything else second. So this is also sometimes a view known as fallibilism, the belief about your beliefs that they may be wrong. And methodologically speaking, this is the commitment in somebody like, for example, John Stuart Mill, uh, uh, commitment to free and equal discussion, free and equal discussion, that um, the only force that a free citizen recognizes is the peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. As, as Jürgen Habermas puts it, der Zwanglosen Zwang des besseren Arguments. Um, and you know, so this this is a, this is a very important method, a very important methodological presupposition of mine. Um, and you know, if this was a general course in philosophy, I'd actually spend a lot of time about how I do believe that this is a very important value. Uh, it's a very it's a very important scientific free and equal discussion, free and equal discussion. It's a very important, maybe the primary scientific value, also the primary um, political value. So it's interface between philosophy of science and philosophy of politics. It's both scientific and, and, and political at the same time. Scientific and political. Scientific consensus and political consensus are of the same nature because they are rooted in the free and equal discussion. Again, peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. Right? Mm. But within this uh, general schema, I would say that the leading idea, and all, I, am, I am moving closer and closer to Thucydides. This is, this is actually already relevant to Thucydides, what I'm saying right now is this notion of mechanistic versus teleological worldview. And so we have this long scientific revolution from Thales to Foucault. Um, and the basic premise, I would say, in some sense, the most important idea in human sciences, period, like the most important idea in all of human sciences, is that we take teleological explanations, purposeful explanations, and we throw them out the window. We uh, debunk them. And instead of these, purposeful explanations uh, explaining um, events or phenomena in terms of purposes, right? Um, we, we debunk those kinds of explanations and instead of them we get mechanistic explanations. And mechanistic explanations explain things in, not in terms of purposes or intentions but in terms of uh, um, something like blind mechanistic causation, so uh, universal exceptionalist principles, something like this. So, in, so, so mechanistic as opposed to teleological. So we have these, um, uh, um, so impersonal um, principle, like universal regularities. You could say laws, laws of nature maybe, or principles, uh, conservation laws, something like that maybe. Uh, uh, instead of this old, uh, if you want, <laughs> Hunter gathering our like I'm not sure if reptilian brain is a good phrase to use here, but our sort of uh, natural uh, illusions and there's an evolutionary account as to how humans acquire these illusions, not just humans but I would imagine living things in general mm, acquire these kinds of perceptive illusions. Um, so so we, we substitute impersonal universal regularities in, in, in place of intentions, intentions um, and purposes. And so the idea of this long scientific revolution is that there are no intentions and no purposes in nature. And um, um, in the words of Immanuel Kant, this is, uh, Kant has a wonderful phrase. He, he talks about der Schlund, das Zwecklosen Chaos der Materie. Der Schlund, das Zwecklosen Chaos der Materie. The abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. This is, this is the world in which we live. And I want to say that, again, this is the most, as far as I can say, as far as I can tell, in the 21st century, this is the most important idea in all human and natural sciences, period. In all sciences, natural and social sciences, period. Mm -hmm. And throughout the history of philosophy in the West and outside the West, there were debates about whether this is the right way to view the world or not. And th these debates are still ongoing. It is my strong conclusion <laughs> after... 20 years of doing philosophy and 10 years of teaching philosophy, it is my strong conclusion that um, it is best to proceed on the assumption that this worldview is correct, that the universe in which we live is indeed the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. And um, 
people debate and philosophers disagree and philosophers always disagree. Philosophers have this uh, <laughs> um, tendency, characteristic, I don't know, um, um, propensity to dis always disagree and, you know, hair splitting uh, distinctions about everything, anything and everything, right? Um, but at the end of the day, even though, again, I'm a skeptic, I'm a skeptic first, mechanicist second, skeptic first, mechanicist second. So I don't think that this is anything like truth with capital T, but I do believe that this uh, assumption of mechanicism is the best working hypothesis available to us in the 21st century. And instead of trying to debunk it somehow or trying to wiggle out using, you know, arguments, especially arguments of God of the gaps, freedom of the gaps, soul of the gaps, teleology of the gaps, right? <laughs> so trying to wiggle out, trying to find gaps in the mechanistic understanding and saying, well, mechanistic picture is incomplete, therefore God or soul or whatever, teleology must be true. So there are strategies like this to try to wiggle out of the mechanistic picture. But I think that our time, in a pragmatic fashion, please uh, uh, see the pragmatic element in what I'm saying, right? Uh, uh, my pragmatic argument is that our time is better spent, our time is better spent trying to think through the implications of the mechanistic picture. Trying to push the mechanistic picture as far as it will go. And honestly, you know, it's like, you don't have to agree with me, but I, I feel that in the 21st century we have overwhelming grounds to accept the mechanistic picture. That, that everything, you know, including, uh, you know, mater material phenomena, uh, physics, physics or, or chemistry, right? Uh, um, as, a, as a subset of that, biology, so life also completely, completely reducible to, you know, uh, uh, electrochemistry of uh, living cells. And so life completely explicable in mechanistic terms, and then also consciousness explicable in mechanistic terms. So um, often, like if this was a course, oops, if this was a course in philosophy of science, I talk about how we go from Thales to Copernicus, to people like especially Darwin, who explains life in mechanistic terms, to then maybe people like Alan Turing, who would explain consciousness in mechanistic terms. And of course, what I have on my slide here is from Thales to Foucault, Michel Foucault is possi possibly, mm, well, it's a debatable question, but, you know, the crowning achievement of the Western philosophical tradition, possibly, possibly. Michel Foucault would also, I feel, independently of Turing, independently of Turing, arrive at the same conclusion. This is, you know, within the French post-structuralism, this is called anti-humanism, trying to explain human behavior in terms of completely, you know, structural, structural mechanistic causes. You know, try to explain consciousness in terms of electrochemistry of the brain. Try to explain electrochemistry of the brain in terms of, you know, social dynamics. And, you know, so there's this uh, interesting interplay between uh, sociology or social theory and then psychology. How societies produce individuals and these individuals in turn, in turn shape societies, right? Mm. And so, with the, and, and, I mean, yeah, so this is uh, um, closer to Thucydides. This, these would be the, the words which are used in Thucydides, sorry, Thucydides scholarship, right? This idea of structure versus agency. Explaining human history and human events in terms of structure, impersonal, structural pressures, structural forces, as opposed to human individual agency, right? And mm, um, basically, I'd say that uh, uh, um, in an important respect, you know, this is, this, is, this is the background of the kind of project that, that I have in my mind, right? And this is also a very important background um, for this project of studying international political theory that, that you and me are going to be spending <laughs> some time together, right? But, but I wanted to situate uh, philosophy of international relations within this general schema. Um, I might talk about this, well, again, I talk about, uh, um, I'm not sure if I should be devoting time to this right now, but I talk about this in, my, um, in some of my other um, uh, courses, how there's this purported graph, this is due to sh uh, uh, philosopher, well, physicist and philosopher of physics, Sean Carroll, how he talks about it, sort of from the Big Bang and uh, like evolution of uh, complexity. And so when you look at this graph of increasing uh, uh, emergent complexity, um, towards the end of this, uh, towards the peak of this inverse parabola, towards the peak of this in inverse parabola, you get uh, something like international relations. So like from when you go from simplicity to complexity, the simplest science would be something like physics, and then international, you know, so, so physics, on top of physics you have chemistry, on top of chemistry you have biology, on top of biology you have 
social science. And on top of social science, well, social science and psychology, on top of that, you have international relations. And in some sense, the international political system is the most complex object of study that human beings have you know, enc encountered ever. So it should be, uh, honestly, not, no surprise that uh, international relations are so complicated because there's a certain way, and again, this graph is due to, uh, this picture is due to, uh, again, many philosophers of physics are on board with this picture, but again, this picture specifically is, is due to Sean Carroll. Um, um, philosopher of physics, um, um, formerly from Caltech, University, uh, California um, University of Technology, Institute of, of Technology, I'm not sure where he is now, he's in Santa Fe, I think, Institute for Study of Complexity or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, 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 yeah, so I have this, uh, Thales, Copernicus, uh, Darwin and Turing, and then Nietzsche, Freud and Marx, um, mm, 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 on, the, on the other hand. Um, <laughs> Um, so I guess I guess I should probably um, go to uh, Thucydides because I could spend actually quite a lot of time talking about this. But I wanted I wanted us to be aware uh, uh, um, of this of this whole um, uh, kind of basis of the story, methodological basis of the story. So again, one last note, but this is almost already talking about Thucydides. Uh, um, so again, we are talking about this realist tradition. And um, um, we are, within this realist tradition, one of the things that we are in the business of doing, uh, I mean, our main textbook is actually called Conflict, War, and Revolution. So in some sense, in some sense our course is very much going to be focused on, on, on thinkers who are broadly construed. I think all or almost all the thinkers in our course can be construed as realists, as realists. And, you know... Uh, we'll have to define at some point, maybe, give some kind of provisional definition for the term realism in international relations. But, but right now, I feel that maybe the most important, uh, the most important defining characteristic mm, of this word would be calling into question the value of values. Like, not accepting the term good, not taking the term good for granted. Mm -hmm. So very famously, Hobbes, um, you know, who's claimed by the realist tradition as one of the <laughs> main proponents, right? Uh, Thomas Hobbes is going to say, uh, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire, that is it which, which man calls good. And the object of man's hate and aversion is what man calls evil, there being nothing simply and absolutely so, right? So Hobbes, the, again, the schlum, the zwecklos and chaos, the materia, abyss of the purposeless, purposeless chaos of matter. Nothing in this universe, nothing in this universe is good or evil by itself. Nothing in this universe is good or evil by itself. Whatever a living thing likes this living thing, if it has language, it calls good. Whatever the living thing dislikes, it calls evil, right? But nothing is simply and absolutely so. And of course, this, this, this is some, some sort of immoralism, amoralism maybe, uh, philosophical uh, anti-moralism, but, but also relativism, because what is good for one organism might not be good for another organism. So implicitly, one of the big targets for this, and by the way, I have to say that, um, um, I'll get to this in a, uh, uh, in a second, I would um, define myself, I think, as something like, um, you know, Foucauldian, Habermasian Marxist. <laughs> so... <laughs> And, but, 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 I am on board with the realist tradition. I think that the basic insights of the realist tradition are correct. So, and I, I do think that the positive project of somebody like Marx has to be established against the background of assumption, of, pes of deeply pessimistic assumptions about human nature. Deeply pessimistic assumptions of people like uh, Thucydides or Machiavelli or uh, Hobbes. So, to me, you know, like in this course, my big question is how do we get, how do we get from um, um, people like Thucydides, uh, Machiavelli, uh, uh, and Hobbes, um, how do we get from these kinds of thinkers to somebody like, uh, well, I have my Hegel, Mill, Marx, Nietzsche, and ultimately Habermas. So how do, you, how do you get from here to there? Um, and I do, I do feel that, you know, this is, this is a worthwhile task, and it's possible to get. I, I want to say that the basic assumptions of these uh, six, seven, eight thinkers are, you know, the basic assumptions are, are the same. Um, or, or, or I don't want to say the same, but close enough. They, they are, you know, talking from the same basic premises. Um, mm, yeah, and mm, so I have this on the slide. So, yeah, so in somebody like Thucydides or, or Hobbes, we have this rel relativism or, or 
the word atheism is difficult to define. Uh, you know, different people have different conceptions of, conceptions of God, so definitions of atheism can differ, right? We'll talk about this today, I hope, a little bit. Um, but I want to say that in many ways, you know, in the realist tradition, you have something like Nietzsche before Nietzsche. God is dead. Va what is the value of values? Revaluation of values, right? And actually, you know, if you, if you, if you uh, watch or listen to my course on Coursera, Introduction to Political Philosophy, in, in, in the 16 lectures that I allowed myself there, I'm actually trying to build up this story, um, which, you know, we, we start from these premises that nothing is good or evil in and of itself. Um, and from this kind of story, we say, well, it's like, you know, the, um, I mean, somebody like Hobbes could say, I have no idea what is good. Hobbes was a skeptic, first and foremost. It's not like he can prove to you that values do not exist. No, Hobbes cannot prove that. But Hobbes says, I wake up in the morning as an empiricist, as a skeptic, as a materialist, and I know that I, meaning like, this, is, this goes back to Socrates, I know that I know nothing. Human knowledge is limited. So we do not have access to truth with capital T or values with capital V. So when I wake up in the morning, my desires impose themselves on me. I can try to work on my desires and I can change my desires. And it's true, you can, you can. And, and much more importantly, not just you can change your desires, like reshape your habits, but much more importantly, uh, society can shape its members in this or that way, in this or that particular way. Um, and um, um, what I'm driving at is that um, we, we start from certain basic uh, inventory of desires, inclinations, you know, appetites, desire for glory, desire for food, desire for sex. And, you know, <laughs> as Nietzsche would say, there's a myriad of souls fighting within, within ourselves, vying for control. A human being is not one thing. A human being is this, you know, in, a Freud, in this Freudian fashion, a proto-Freudian fashion, is this complex uh, hydraulic system of different different mechanisms fighting against each other. There's this internal struggle. And I mean, Plato, of course, Plato is on board with this picture. Plato is gonna say how this, the rational part of the, soul, of the soul, which is driven by desire, by a passionate desire for knowledge. There's the spirited part of the soul, which is driven by passionate desire for glory. Notice, the rational part of the soul is not an impartial calculator. The rational part of the soul is also driven by desire. Desire to know, it's a desire. So desire to know, desire for glory, and then there's the appetitive part of the soul, which is actually in Plato, not one part, but many different parts, because human beings have also many different appetites. You have desires for, you know, uh, calm, tranquil, uh, safe pleasures, or you have extravagant desires for extravagant pleasures, or maybe you have even uh, disorderly, ruthless, antisocial desires, uh, psychopathic, uh, man, you know, man, uh, manic desires to, you know, kill, rape, or murder, right? And, you know, after, after Freud, we, ha we have to be, you know, we have to seriously take into account all, this, all these facets of human nature. So it's like, and so, so human beings are this, um, by definition, start out as these complex bundles of varying conflicting desires. So there's internal conflict, conflict within the self. This is to some extent what Foucault means by anti-humanism. Human being is not one thing. Human beings are these sort of products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution. Human beings are products of larger forces of biological and cultural evolution, right? Uh, um, and so there's internal conflict within each individual, and then these individuals are not naturally cooperative. Society is not natural. Society is deeply artificial, especially complex society. I mean, ancient, like, no, not ancient, but prehistoric, prehistoric hunter-gathering societies might have been more natural there's some continuity, anthropological, anth my anthropologist friends tell me that there's some continuity between, um, let's say, the kinds of um, group dynamics that you get among, let's say, chimpanzees or gorillas, which presumably are natural, right, not cultural or artificial. Um, and there's continuity between that, between, you know, the, the way apes behave in a group setting and the way early humans behave in a group setting. So maybe hunter-gathering bands roaming hunter-gathering bands of about 40 individuals, maybe those are natural. But the kinds of societies that you get, especially, you know, with the Neolithic revolution and the emergence of agriculture, and certainly the kind of society that we inhabit today, these are highly, highly artificial. And there's a deep mismatch between our, the proclivities of our biology uh, uh, and, and the world that we live in. So basically, you know, as far as my, you know, biologist and 
uh, psychologist friends tell me, you know, our, bio, our biological makeup, our psych basic biological, psychological makeup is not made to live, you know, <laughs> you know, in a megapolis or talk to people through <laughs> Teams or Zoom or whatever, or through YouTube, which, which, bring, which, which opens um, opportunities but also offers challenges. So opportunities and challenges at the same time. So even though maybe, again, small primitive societies are in some sense natural, but larger, more complex society, societies are artificial, which means that they can be well-constructed or badly constructed. And so, again, we start from these amoral, non-moral premises. Again, I wake up in the morning and des my desires impose themselves on me. And in some sense, we all wake up in the morning and all of our desires impose themselves on all of us. And in the course of human um, cultural evolution, and when I say cultural evolution, I'm talking about group dynamics, right? So the same way how you have competition in the um, natural sphere, you know, competition between organisms, right? In a similar fashion, you have competition between societies. And if you think about this for five seconds, right? Most cultures which have existed are extinct. Most cultures which have existed, most human cultures which have existed throughout the history of humanity are now extinct. Most societies have have been destroyed or conquered, most languages have died, most religions have died. So the ones that have survived have found a certain way to channel and to organize human, you know, these, these bundles of human desires, to channel these uh, 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 pressures, if you want, to channel these internal psychological forces into at least to some extent, to some extent, uh, 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 socially productive or socially cooperative ways. Mm. There's this interesting question which, which, you know, I suppose um, it's a good time to mention about conflict and consensus, you know, um, and, you know, this is a topic which, to which we'll return, I think, many times, right? So you can imagine, uh, um, you know, so I, I just talked about how human, human beings are not naturally cooperative, so you can imagine some kind of dystopian uh, slave-holding society. I mean, we'll talk about Sparta, and it's very difficult, it's very difficult to talk about historical Sparta, um, in, in impartial terms, because basically um, our evidence for the Spartan way of life is extremely uh, limited, okay? And some, some scholars even call this the Spartan mirage, Spartan mirage. And the two kinds of sources that we get about Sparta um, are usually, you know, outside foreign sources, maybe, maybe always outside foreign sources, um, and some of them idealize Sparta and think they're the best society ever, and other, and other sources uh, vilify Sparta and imagine it's a horrible slave-owning society and, you know, it's a kind of like, like, a, like a concentration camp of a society. But esp especially, so when I talk about this conflict and consensus, so on this, on this bleak picture of the Spartan society of a, as, a, as a sort of a slave-holding concentration camp, perpetual concentration camp, which may or may not, which may or may not be true, because again, there were no cameras back then. It's not like we have good documentary evidence to judge what Spartan society was like. You know, people say all sorts of things about societies for ideological reasons. You cannot necessarily trust everything that has been written. Anyway, so, but, but sort of, so you can imagine how this problem of politics, so basically, so, you know, if there are no values with capital V, if there are no capital V values, we're only left with common interest, right? And so one way to sort of uh, um, achieve this, um, you know, Real, uh, not, I don't want to say harmony, but kind of peace, peace in society. No, not peace, but let's say let's maybe let's use the word order. So order can be conflictual or it can be consensual. So conflictual order is that people obey, but they obey because they're afraid or because they have been lied to. So this is the conflict side. You obey, and yet you obey only out of fear or because you have been deceived. Uh, uh, so so basically, force and fraud. Let me write force and fraud. Um, or, or, and this is the other alternative, which we have to be very careful because is any society really perfectly consensual? Is any society really perfectly consensual? Probably not, probably not. So this is probably more, more about talking about a continuum. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm able to give this lecture right now and you're able to listen to this lecture right now. So probably, you know, I live in a society which is at least to some extent consensual. It's consensual enough to allow me to study philosophy and to prepare for a lecture like this, right? And probably your society, I, I have no idea, my dear listener, which society you come from, right? But pr probably if you have time to spare to listen to lectures, highfalutin lectures about philosophy, and you're not worried that you're going to die in the next second, probably your society is also not completely, not completely conflictual, right? Mm. 
And so to the extent that societies are consensual, but it's a, it's a continuum and consensus is often maybe like an ideal or an ideal type. Like not, not necessarily real type, but sort of kind of an ideal towards which we strive, like a, a gold standard, uh, gold standard, ideal type, right? And the consensus view would be that um, society is based on, on, tr on true common interest, free and equal discussion, free development of each as a condition for the free development of all. We'll, we'll definitely talk more about this in future classes. But this is basically the idea, like to me, that there, there are four corners of this view of consensus, consensus view of society, right? And, and these four corners are Hegel, Mill, Marx, and Nietzsche. Hegel, Mill, Marx, and Nietzsche. Four very important, very influential philosophers, uh, which are crucial for my understanding of political philosophy. We will not study any of them in this course. We will not study Hegel or Mill or Marx or Nietzsche, unfortunately, in this course. And, and, and I want to say that the insights of all four, I feel to some extent can be summarized in the works of Jürgen Habermas, which is why I have this, right? But uh, uh, even though they're not part of the course, I feel that they're sort of on the sidelines, behind the scenes, they will be interlocutors to us all throughout the course. So I'm, I'm slowly <laughs> moving towards Thucydides. So my reading of Thucydides is basically through the prism of uh, um, Marx, uh, uh, Mill, Nietzsche, and, and uh, Hegel. Hegel, Marx, Mill, and Nietzsche, right? And, and ultimately Habermas, right? Mm. And again, as, as I already mentioned, right? So the, the question is, how do you get from Thucydides, Machiavelli, and Hobbes to uh, who, who basically, and, and in some sense, yeah, so this is, this is what we have. So we have this continuum of conflict and consensus. So from conflict in Thucydides, uh, Machiavelli, and Hobbes, they are deeply pessimistic about human nature, to the consensus of uh, Hegel, Mill, Marx, and Nietzsche. And this is, uh, in the words of my, one of my favorite philosophers who inspires me, in, who, uh, source of infinite inspiration for me, Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci would say that, the conflict side is the pessimism of the intellect uh, and the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the consensus side is the optimism of the will. So when we look outside the window, it's so very easy to... Um, so let me, let me write the, word, the name of Gramsci here, maybe. Um, um, so when we, when, I, when, I, when we look outside the window, I feel that the insights of Thucydides, Machiavelli, and Hobbes seem very realistic to me, and this is my pessimism of the intellect, but I want to say that from within Thucydides, Machiavelli, and Hobbes, Thucydides, Machiavelli, and Hobbes, all, all three of them and other realist philosophers as well, will show us the glimpses of possibilities of evolution towards more harmonious societies, like the ones that Hegel, Mill, Marx, and Nietzsche imagine, although really mostly imagine because, you know, is any society consensual and to what extent is a very complicated question I'll, I'll, I'll leave um, for you to, uh, uh, to think about and discuss. Um, so I guess this ends um, kind of my uh, preliminary introduction and uh, um, I'm thinking maybe I, could, um, maybe I could just pause the stream here and, and sort of to, to break this into smaller chunks uh, for ease of navigation watching. So let me restart the stream and I'll, I'll t this, and this is, you know, imagine this was just an introduction and we'll, we'll talk about facilities proper in the next section. And watching. So let me restart the stream and I'll, I'll t this, and this is, you know, imagine this was just an introduction and we'll, we'll talk about facilities proper in the next section. <laughs>